Welcome back to the Mac Admins 22 Campfire Sessions. We're going to go ahead and continue with today's second half. Our uh, second speaker is Jim Rispin on the One is the Loneliest Number, a survival guide for managing and working remotely. How are you today, Jim? I'm doing all right, thanks. Great. If you'd like to go ahead and share your slides, we can go ahead and get started. You got them? Can you see them? We can, and they are now live. You are good to go. So everyone give a nice warm welcome to Jim. I'm going to assume the applause is happening in the background or I can't hear it. But hello, friends. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening to you wherever or whenever you might be watching this talk. I'm honored that you've gifted me this time. I hope that by the end you found it to be time well spent or at least better spent than watching another hour of YouTube cooking videos for things you're never actually going to cook. Um, my name is Jim Rispin, and I'm the Deputy Chief Technology Officer at Fuller Seminary in Pasadena, California. I've been doing management in some form or fashion for over a decade now, and I've previously presented on similar topics like how to care for your team, how to manage up, and even how to be a great on-site manager. But today, I'm coming to you a bit more sheepishly with a little less swagger in my step. Whereas previously, I felt pretty confident in my management style and management skills. Since the shift to remote work, that confidence has been severely shaken. Despite my previous success as a manager, I've had to learn all new ways to support, encourage, coach, and lead my teams in this new remote setting. And in all honesty, there have been many times over the last couple of years when I've been fairly certain I was failing. Maybe that resonates with some of you, and if it does, I hope something from this talk today can help you regain some of your own management swagger. Now, some of what I'll share today may seem obvious and simple to many of you, but I'll offer this caveat. Just because it's obvious doesn't mean it's automatic, and just because it's simple to understand doesn't mean it's easy to do. So if you can keep an open mind and muster as much self-awareness as possible for the next 45 minutes, I promise you'll come away with something useful. So what is the goal of successful remote management? Well, I'll be honest, I'm still trying to work this out, but is it to make sure my team is fully informed on all of the projects, initiatives, and priorities of my entire organization? Is it to make sure they feel fully connected as a team on both an emotional and professional level? Is it to ensure they have all the resources they need to succeed in their work, no matter the cost? Is it to ensure each individual team member feels completely supported in every aspect of their work? Is it to advocate for them at all levels of the organization so that they are adequately recognized for the great work that they do? Is it all of the above? Is it none of the above? When you put it all together, is it even achievable? The work of a manager can feel overwhelming in the best of times, but we left the best of times in our rearview mirror over two years ago. So. How do we define success in this new normal as a remote manager? Again, I'm still working it out, but some clear goals are beginning to rise to the surface. Now, we won't spend a lot of time on the broader philosophies of successful and healthy management in favor of spending time on practical tips and tactics. But one thing I will say is that embracing the values of trust, accountability, vulnerability and communication can make all the difference in how successful you are as a remote manager and how successful your team is at accomplishing their goals. Trust isn't a one way street. It means you trust your team, your team trusts you and your team trusts each other. This has always been vital for healthy, productive teams, but never more so than in our current remote environment. Accountability is another thing that goes both ways. Everyone, including you, should know what they're accountable for, and most importantly, everyone should be able to hold each other accountable in a candid and healthy way. Vulnerability is an essential prerequisite for building trust, and this is one where you as the manager need to take the lead and set the tone. If you have it in your head that vulnerability doesn't belong in the workplace, read anything from Brene Brown and she will divest you of that notion in no time. And lastly, your communication needs to flow freely between all members of your team. If your team is relying entirely on you to provide all the information necessary to do their work, 
communi communication breakdowns will happen. So if you can keep these four values at the center of your culture and operation, you go a long way towards achieving the success you want for your team. Now let's talk about challenges. The shift to remote work has likely surfaced a number of challenges for you and your team. Now, some may be unique to your organization or circumstances, but many are likely common among all teams. So before we dive into the tips and tactics for improving your lot as a remote manager, and hopefully by extension, the lot of your remote teams, let's highlight some of the common challenges that your team might be facing. This first one is kind of obvious, but with many of us working remote and spending less or no time in the office, we just see each other less. This means less opportunity for connection, less team building, less ad hoc communication, less chances to provide and receive feedback, all of which can have a significant impact on morale and productivity. Now, the manager who assumes that this will work itself out naturally and that their team will achieve a new sense of equilibrium all on their own will likely be doing a lot of rehiring or possibly looking for another job themselves. So in an effort to compensate for the lack of face-to-face -face interactions, many of us have turned to Zoom or Teams or Hangouts or whatever. And this has led to the inevitable problem of Zoom or video conferencing fatigue. Now there are a myriad of ways to combat this, reduce the frequency or the length of meetings, move to audio only meetings, meet in person when possible. But the important thing is to be aware of this challenge and try to anticipate and mitigate its negative effects. If you're not intentionally and aggressively increasing your level of communication between and among your teams, then breakdowns in communication and an increased fear of missing out are inevitable for all of your teams. When they're no longer bumping into each other in the hallway or chatting each other up at their desks, the potential for communication loss is substantial. You may find that one of your newest and most important jobs as a remote manager is making sure everyone stays informed. But as I mentioned before, this can't fall entirely on you to be the source of all information. Recognizing the potential for increased feelings of loneliness and isolation among your team is just as important as supporting your team's productivity. If you're lucky enough to have a bunch of introverts on your team, this may not be as big of a concern, though good luck getting everyone to turn on their cameras for Zoom meetings. But for the rest of us, and even for some of those introverts, the shift to remote work has meant confronting unexpected and sometimes intense feelings of isolation and loneliness. This is not to suggest that managers need to become therapists to help their teams work through these feelings. That would be inappropriate. But pretending they don't exist and then punishing your team for the impact they can have on productivity is equally inappropriate. We'll talk about how you help your team deal with distractions in a little while, but for now, just know that this is a real thing for everyone on your team, including you. Whether it's dealing with a demanding kid or spouse, a puking cat, or an ill-advised YouTube rabbit hole, distractions are inevitable. How you talk about them and how you help your team navigate them could define the boundaries of how much trust you're able to achieve with your team. On the flip side of the distraction coin is boundaries, or rather the lack thereof that has emerged in our remote work environments. And this has inexorably led to overwork and burnout in many teams. When your office is mere feet from the rest of your living space, the temptation to allow one to intrude upon the other is strong. And the example of how to set and hold appropriate boundaries begins with you, the manager. If you allow your work life to regularly intrude on your personal life, your team will likely follow suit and the consequences for them and their families could be significant. Now your team may be experiencing some or all of these challenges. And again, there are likely other challenges unique to your team or your industry. Either way, it's important to name the challenges your team is facing and make space to openly discuss them. Otherwise, Members of your team are left to assume that they're the only ones struggling with a particular challenge and that they're likely on their own to overcome it. So now that we know some of the challenges your team might be facing in the remote environments that they're in, how can you come alongside and help them confront these challenges? 
Well, that's what this next section is for. I'll note that these tips and tactics are not meant to be all encompassing. They're just some specific ideas that have worked for me or that I've aspired to implement with my team as we navigate this new normal. If this list piques your interest, a simple Google search will provide you a wealth of other things you can try, and I'll include some of those links and resources at the end. First, focus on outcome, not process. I put this one at the very top because if you remember nothing else from this talk, I want you to hold on to this. If you can create a culture with your remote team where outcome matters more than process, you'll alleviate so many other headaches and heartaches that come with working remotely. Of course, you can't get here without a healthy level of trust and accountability, as well as clearly defined goals and objectives, and you'll need to make sure you're giving your team all the training and resources they need to succeed, but you already know that. But if you can set the expectations and then get out of their way, you'll likely be amazed at what your team can accomplish. Not only will you improve their level of engagement, but you'll also boost their creativity and degree of ownership over their work. I mean, let's be honest, micromanaging your team's process sucks in the best of circumstances, but in a remote setting, it's virtually impossible, pun intended, at least not without destroying your team's morale and job satisfaction. Leaning into outcome over process is the best way to maximize your team's engagement and empower them to do their best work. Next, encourage and model healthy boundaries. I mentioned this a moment ago when talking about the challenges your team likely faces in their remote work, but it's important to remember that the move to remote work in the last two years has created some extremely blurred lines between work life and home life. Many of us, myself included, have found ourselves working far beyond our expected hours simply because it was easy to do so. With the work environment now fully enmeshed in the home, the tendency to overwork is more tempting than ever. Therefore, it's more important than ever for managers to encourage and especially model boundaries. Show your team that you know and respect when it's time to stop working and do other things. Make liberal use of the scheduled send feature in your email or Slack. Build redundancy into your team through cross-training so you don't need to interrupt someone's vacation because they're the only one who can restore that server and model healthy behavior by not responding to messages after hours unless it's absolutely necessary. Your team will follow your lead, good or bad. And this is one where both your team and your family will likely benefit from your healthy work-life boundaries. I mentioned the challenge of distractions before as well, and I'll say it again. Distractions for your remote teams are a fact of life but don't make it taboo to admit they exist and to openly discuss ways to navigate them. In fact, this is a perfect opportunity to show some vulnerability to your team and build some of the essential trust we talked about earlier. If you fell down a rabbit hole of YouTube movie trailers during your morning coffee and failed to adequately prepare for that afternoon staff meeting, own up to it and use it as a way to collaborate on ways to stay focused while working remotely. The less your team feels need to hide inevitable distractions from you and the rest of their team, the more opportunities you'll have to build trust and establish norms for healthy and candid accountability. Accept and acknowledge that you and your team will get distracted while working remotely, but don't make the mistake of creating a culture of shame and secrecy around it that will severely undermine your team's ability to trust each other. Next, Make sure you're creating space for your team to recharge throughout the day. That could be something as small as shrinking your standard one hour meeting to 50 minutes to organically allow for breaks from work, or it can be setting up a Slack channel where you let your team members share their best ideas for self care and recharging. You could even go so far as to set the expectation that your team explicitly schedule work free hours during the day to recharge by spending time with family or doing other self-care activities. Whatever it may be, don't just pay lip service to the idea of recharging and self-care, but actually making an expected and understood part of your team's culture. Now, when things get rough in remote work or in work in general, it's easy to fall into the habit of focusing on the positive as a way of helping your team cope with the challenge of the moment. But, resist the urge to only ever focus on the positive. 
allow room for your team to be sad, frustrated, angry, and disillusioned, and risk showing them when you're feeling less than positive. Modeling this kind of vulnerability can help your team know that it's safe to bring all of themselves to their work. Now, obviously, you want to avoid descending into negativity so much that you lose yourself to cynicism. But making space for the full spectrum of the emotions we feel in our work can build immense amounts of trust among your team. And acknowledging the shitty things at work in a genuine way without succumbing to toxic ranting can breed a level of honest and candid communication essential for healthy teams to thrive. Now, in the midst of our isolation, especially when things aren't going great, it can sometimes be difficult to ask for help. Even with something that would have been easy to bring to a colleague in a traditional in-person setting, asking for support with something you're struggling with can seem extra challenging in a remote setting. So make it easier and even natural for your team to bring these things to the group. Set a regular time for your team to connect over Zoom and share something they're struggling with and allow the rest of the team to offer ideas or resources to support their struggle. Then take the extra step to track these requests through a shared document and stay connected about them between meetings to demonstrate genuine support. The benefit this will provide your team in both a professional growth and emotional support capacity can't be understated. I hope you already know the importance of one on one meetings with everyone on your team, but in a remote environment, they're even more critical. With a lack of ad hoc hallway or water cooler conversations, it's important to maximize the face time you get from your one on ones. To that end, if your regular schedule for one on ones with your team is once a month or every other week, consider increasing the frequency of those meetings or possibly supplementing them with brief daily check ins to make up for the loss of your usual face to face interactions. Also consider setting up a special Slack channel or other repository between you and each member of your team to log things you need to discuss at your next one on one. Whatever you do, don't neglect the one on ones with your team. It may be the only dedicated time you get with each of them. And if you're missing them, there's a whole host of things that could quickly get off course. One bonus tip while we're talking about one on ones. If you have your one on one over Zoom or another video conferencing platform, turn off your self view and encourage your team to do the same. You will be amazed how much more engaged you are when you're not constantly distracted by your own face. In fact, I'd recommend it for nearly all your video conferencing meetings to improve engagement. Now in the past, I've talked about the risk of creating communication overload with your teams if you try to communicate too much, but in a remote work environment, things look very different. The isolation and lack of organic ad hoc conversations create an environment where communication gaps can be vast. As such, beyond the regular check-ins with each of your team members, increasing your communication with your whole team to the point of over-communicating can make a huge difference in helping them feel connected to their work and the rest of their team. Now, many teams struggled with adequate communication even when everyone was on site, but when some or all of your team is working remotely, a lack of communication can be a productivity death sentence. Therefore, lean heavily into the communication tools your teams rely on to stay connected and informed. Go crazy with new Slack channels. Wear out the update function of your project management tool. Religiously embrace monthly or quarterly all team meetings to ensure everyone stays informed on all the work that's going on. If your team's not occasionally whining about how much they've already heard this information, you're probably not doing enough. While we're on the topic of over communicating, this one may only work if you're using the right kind of chat platform, but for us as Slack users, it works perfectly. If you flew on a commercial airplane in the days before in-flight movies and Wi-Fi, you likely experienced the joys of in-flight radio as a way to pass the time. Among the various channels you could choose from from the armrest of your seat was a very special one called Channel 9. This channel was a direct link to the pilot of your airplane and the communication he or she had with their fellow pilots and ground control during the flight. Basically, it was a play by play of what was happening with the pilot throughout the flight. Well, one of my ingenious sysadmins adopted this practice several years back to post the various things he was working on throughout his day. 
It's a read-only channel that only he can post, but all of the team could read. Slowly, other team members, myself included, started up our own channels nine, and they became a valuable part of our communication with each other. And then the pandemic hit, and those channels became essential. Now, in addition to our usual team Slack channels, we have the running play-by-play -play -play of each member through their individual channel nine as they go about their remote workday. Obviously, some folks are more verbose than others, but it all contributes to the overall communication and connection we have with each other. Not to mention helping me as their manager ensure my team is staying up on task. One more tip on communication. If your team has some creativity to burn and you can get enough participation, you could try putting out a monthly or quarterly team newsletter as a way to create connection, celebrate wins, and have a little fun. There are a few things to consider if you're going to try and put one of these together. First, stay positive. This is not the place to unpack the downturn in the market that may lead to layoffs. But by the same token, don't just make it a rah-rah cheerleading time that comes across as insincere. Make sure it's relevant and interesting, but don't violate confidentiality or share information that's not really meant for the entire team. Make it as inclusive as possible, inviting participation from all levels of your team, leadership included, but have some fun with it. I'll include a link at the end of the talk that goes into greater detail on putting together a successful team newsletter if you want to give it a try. Okay, this one is a general health rule, just across the board. In fact, I'm guessing it's been a while since any of you stood up today, unless you're one of those overachievers with a standing desk. So let's do it together. Everybody up. Oh boy. I can't actually see if you're doing it, so I'll just trust. And a little stretch. Oh, 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 oh yeah, that's what we needed. All right, back to it. Okay, these next few tips apply specifically to remote meetings. Again, some of these may be obvious to you, but they bear repeating nonetheless. The first is a drum I've beaten so much I've become the Phil Collins of my remote team, and that is agendas. Create them, distribute them before your meetings, and follow them during your meetings. This one tip will improve your standing as a manager immensely. If you struggle with making agendas, consider creating a Slack channel or shared Google Doc where your team can drop topics for discussion between meetings. Not only will it make creating the agenda a simple copy and paste operation, but you'll be sure to discuss topics of particular importance for your team. In the new reality of Zoom fatigue, expecting our teams to be camera ready for every meeting is probably asking too much. Therefore, Consider setting rules for camera ready versus camera optional meetings. Maybe you make your daily stand up meeting camera optional, but ask everyone to be camera ready for your more interactive weekly staff meeting. You can also try to regularly rotate between audio only and camera on meetings as a way of combating Zoom fatigue or just caring for your more introverted team members. And for the meetings where it's appropriate, Take advantage of the more novel features of your video conferencing platform like my team did during one of our recent staff meetings. We actually did our entire meeting this way and it was surprisingly liberating and still very engaging. Okay, let me tell you a story. I recently participated in an interview for a director position in my institution. As many interviews are these days, this one was happening over Zoom. While I was running late to the interview and also was using a borrowed laptop for the meeting, that didn't have my usual default settings enabled. I think you can see where this is going. I jumped into the meeting and immediately noticed the other participants had already joined, including the candidate who had joined over his phone with no video. And my immediate reaction was, joining a video interview from your phone? What the f- Which I said out loud, while my mic was unmuted. I can't see it, but I'm gonna guess your reaction is the same as everyone I've told this story to. And that is why the mute button is your best friend. At this point in our remote work lives, I shouldn't have to say this, but there always seems to be one person in every meeting who intentionally or otherwise leaves their mic on at the worst possible time during a meeting, regardless of the activity happening around them. Hopefully your experience is not as embarrassing as mine, but at a minimum, this can be very distracting and annoying, especially in larger meetings. So. 
I officially give each and every one of you permission to interrupt whomever is speaking and ask that person to mute their microphone. The entire room will thank you for it. Now, if your company culture will allow for it, and maybe even if it won't, consider establishing meeting free days where no meetings can be scheduled to allow for uninterrupted project or productivity time. This can go a long way to reducing Zoom fatigue and providing your team with the additional break they need to recharge. And in those rare cases where you absolutely need to gather for something, i.e. a crisis, consider an audio huddle over Slack or just a simple conference call. If this is something that would be difficult for your organization to adopt in mass, try setting the example with your team by encouraging them to block out the time on their calendar, preventing members of other teams from scheduling meetings on your meeting free day. It may seem a little passive aggressive, but if you communicate to other managers the goal you have in mind and why your team isn't available on a certain day of the week, you may find that they begin to adopt a similar practice. And eventually you might reach a tipping point in your organization where you can decide on a corporate meeting free day. Okay, over the last two years, we've all had our share of forced fun. The virtual happy hour that your boss insists you attend to maintain team morale, the virtual birthday or going away party that requires everyone to say something nice about the guest of honor. I have lost count of the number of times I've dropped into these work meetings disguised as social events, only to fake a bad Wi-Fi connection and pull a virtual Irish exit. Now don't get me wrong, I understand the motivation for these events. Organizations are scrambling to make up for the lost connection their employees are experiencing in the wake of the shift to remote work. But so many of these are cringe inducing awkward events that we can't wait to be over. So if your team is doing a regular social gathering that involves a little more than staring at each other on screen, waiting for someone to say something interesting, maybe consider better use of that time. As an alternative, try building time into the start or end of your regular meetings to connect with each other and share non work related info about your life. Hey, what, what was that TV show you've been watching? Or, hey, let me share this really awesome meme I just found. Or, hey, where'd you guys go on vacation last week? Frequent but brief opportunities for shared fun can build just as much, if not more, connection than awkwardly staring at each other for 45 minutes once or twice a month. But that's not to say that a little forced fun isn't appropriate from time to time, as long as you plan well. So to help you along for your next event, here are a few quick micro tips for planning a virtual team gathering that might not suck. First, believe that it will be awesome. You might need to fake it for the first little bit, but if you believe that your event is gonna break the mold and be fantastic, that enthusiasm might just carry over to your team and they will come into your event believing it as well. But even if they don't, that could still play to your favor. If your team is convinced that yours will be another in a long line of lame virtual events, the bar will be set so low that you won't need to do much to make your event memorable. Look to the cool kids in your team to help you drum up excitement about the event. If you can get the people whose opinions are most respected in your team to share your enthusiasm, it might help win over the reluctant crowd. Alleviate some of the anxiety that the time will be awkward and boring by assuring your team that the event will be less than 30 minutes. In fact, if you promise 30 minutes and finish in 20 minutes, you'll be a hero and everyone will likely leave wanting more. Assuming you have a limited, i.e. no budget for your event, as most of us do, get your team to participate with whatever they might have on hand. Homemade signs, silly hats, pets that are in close proximity, whatever helps bring some fun and weird energy to your gathering will make a big, big difference. And finally, don't forget to bring the fun. Have some small game or theme to draw everyone in. Compete for who can share the worst movie trailer they found on YouTube. Play a short round of Among Us. Or do a mystery gift exchange and have your team gift each other a little bit of weirdness from the internet. It is possible to build team connection through forced fun and not have it feel so forced. 
It just requires a little planning and a smidgen of faith that these times can be successful. And in the absence of organic connection in the office, they probably are a vital component of a healthy team, even if they're not always something we look forward to. But that's not to say that we should abandon all hope of ever seeing each other in person again. In fact, whenever possible, you should encourage your team to get out of their office and meet people in person. Whether that's taking a meeting with another team member who's in their area or having lunch with a friend, getting out of their remote office can make all the difference for a healthy and productive day. I know for me, especially at the height of the pandemic, I went months without seeing another member of my team, let alone anyone else besides my own family in person. And that had a significant impact on my sense of connection with my teammates. It may seem like a small thing, but simply meeting someone in person can restore and reinvigorate your feelings of trust and camaraderie with that person. And this can pay serious dividends in future collaboration and productivity. And by the way, this holds just as true for the introverts on your team as well. OK, putting aside the social and moving back to the productive, consider adopting an agile based project management framework and subsequent project management tool, even if you're not doing traditional project work. Just for your regular operations, complex tasks or management responsibilities, this can really improve your team's overall productivity. It's a natural way to encourage accountability and improve communication around even the most basic of tasks on a remote team. You can use something simple and free like Trello or Teamline, which integrates nicely with Slack, or you can dive deep into a full project management tool like ClickUp, Basecamp, or Rike. Either way, if you embrace this kind of process and tool, you may find that it dramatically improves your team's clarity and expectations for their work. Okay, this one will certainly add to your workload as a manager, at least initially but the dividends can really pay off in the long term if you can commit to the practice. The next time one of your team members asks you a question about a process, practice, or policy, instead of just answering them privately via email, phone, or chat, commit that answer to a shared repository that can be viewed by the entire team. You can start this practice the very next time someone asks you a question, but possibly the easiest time to get it going is when you bring someone new onto your team. New hires have a wealth of questions and imagine the efficiencies and consistency you could create if you committed those questions and answers to a published document your whole team could search and reference. Or you can go one step further and create an entire handbook that your team can refer to and update as necessary to answer questions and make decisions. I'll share some information at the end to get you started on building this kind of resource if you're interested. This last tip is like the first in that if you're able to embrace it wholeheartedly, it will mitigate a host of other heartaches and frustrations that can arise from remote work. And it's simply this. Be flexible and empathetic and encourage the same of every member of your team. Here's a reality. Everyone on your team is facing a different set of circumstances. Some will be sharing space with spouses or children and some won't. Some will have a dedicated home office space while others might be working from their bedroom or closet or dining room table. Some may be at a local coffee shop because their home internet is so poor. Regardless of the circumstance, it's your job as their manager to understand and empathize with each and every one of these situations and accept that none of them will be completely ideal. How you model empathy and flexibility for each of your individual team members in the face of these varied circumstances will set the example for how they respond to each other. If you can demonstrate genuine care for your team, offer a sympathetic ear when it's needed, be flexible when unexpected disruptions to their remote workspace happen, and offer sincere empathy when difficulties arise, the other challenges that come from being a remote manager will feel much more, well, manageable. One last bonus tip that's really more of a shameless plug. Much of what I've presented in previous talks about management and managing up still applies in a remote setting. So if you need a refresher on those, check out these talks on the Mac Admin YouTube channel. All right, before we wrap up, let's take a few brief moments and talk about some practical tools you can try that might improve your work, your remote work and that of your team. 
For this part, I'm going to blow past the obvious tools that you're probably already using Slack, Zoom, Google Drive, OneDrive, etc., and focus on a few tools that you might not have heard of or suggest using a tool in a new way you might not have considered. First up is password managers. Now, I assume you're all using a password manager for your personal use. If you're not, stop watching this right now and go set one up. Your improved security will be more than worth the trade off you lose in watching the rest of this talk. But you may not have considered setting up a shared password manager for your team to use. This has always been a useful tool in my team, but it has become essential in our remote work environment when the availability of individual team members can vary widely. Some password managers lend themselves better to this than others, but we've had great success with both LastPass and 1Password in this role. A special nod to 1Password, even though they're not an official sponsor of this talk. If you sign up for the 1Password Teams subscription, each member of your team will get a 1Password family subscription for free. Now, I stumbled onto 15.5 partway through the pandemic and have been using it ever since as a way to take the pulse of my team in between our regular one on one meetings. They have a host of tools for improving your team's engagement and performance and for getting to the root of specific challenges individual team members might be facing that could otherwise go unnoticed and unaddressed. In the interest of full disclosure, I am cheap and so I am not paying for the full suite of 15.5's offerings but they are generous enough to provide some of their key tools for free that it still made it very worthwhile for me to use them. The one I rely on most is their check-in tool that allows each member of my team to submit a weekly check-in report dealing how their, detailing how their week went overall as well as answering insightful questions about the team and our organization at large. I then have the opportunity to review each of these reports and respond either in the tool itself or use it as a way to inform the discussion during our next one on one. As I said, it's free to jump in and test them out and certain tools remain free indefinitely, so it's absolutely worth your time to check them out. Now, whether it's a quick walkthrough tutorial to help someone set up an email filter or a full blown training video for a new team member, Having a screen recording tool in your remote work arsenal can be a godsend. Since we can no longer walk over to someone's desk and show them how to do something simple on their computer, being able to run through those same steps on your own computer while recording the process and sending it over to them can save hours of frustration for you and for them. And if you work in higher ed and uh, like I do, a tool like this is essential for your faculty members to record their lectures for virtual class sessions. But it's also been extremely helpful for my tech support team to provide quick how to videos when they can't easily share their own screen with a client. Sure, you could probably do the same thing by recording a shared screen zoom session on your computer, but something like loom makes the process of capturing editing and sharing so much easier. Their free plan lets you record 25 five minute videos. And if you're in education, you can take advantage of the free educator plan with almost no limitations. Now, obviously traditional whiteboarding is no longer possible in our remote settings, but that doesn't mean you need to abandon your inner marker fiend. Online whiteboard tools like Miro, Limnu, Stormboard, and Google's Jamboard have made it possible to recapture the magic of whiteboard sessions with your team. And for those of us who sucked at traditional whiteboarding anyway, some of these tools make it much easier to collaborate and brainstorm, regardless of our lack of skill with a dry erase marker. In addition, most of them integrate nicely with your favorite video conferencing platform, making it a breeze to use them in the digital meeting space you're already in. Of course, if your needs are fairly basic, you could just rely on the whiteboarding tool that's probably built into your VC platform of choice. But if your needs are a little greater, consider looking for an online whiteboard that has an unlimited canvas, uh, built-in collaboration features, can attach files, and makes it easy to transition your whiteboard session straight into a presentation. Some of these tools are so great, you won't even miss the dry erase markers unless you happen to be in it for the smell. Now, if anyone on your team struggles with getting good audio out of your video conferencing calls, consider using CRISP. CRISP takes audio filtering and noise cancellation to the next level with their AI powered tool that can remove unwanted noise from both ends of a call. 
I've been using Crisp on and off for several months, and it's made a world of difference in my calls, especially when my environment is noisier than I can control. Of course, they have a free forever plan that provides 60 minutes of filtering per day that you can decide how to spread across your meetings. You could use it all up in one meeting or save it for when your dog decides it's time to start practicing his guard dog duties. And lastly, if you or someone you know on your team just can't seem to rein in their Netflix or TikTok addiction, maybe it's time to consider a focus app that will give you some extra protection against distractions. Now, some might say that all we need is a little more discipline, but I would argue that some of the greatest minds in any generation are doing everything they can to get us to scroll more, click more, and watch more. So I say there's no shame in getting a little help to build that discipline. Focus apps are designed to provide controlled blocking of the various things that pull us away from our work when we can least afford it. Now, these are not shame-filled parental control apps. They're designed to respect your dignity and autonomy as an adult while providing you the tools you need to stay focused on the things you want to stay focused on. Some provide a simple audio focus, e.g. Brain FM, offering an alternative to the 80s rock ballad playlist on Spotify that can be less than conducive to work. Others will simply block specific websites defined by you for the period of time that you desire. While still others, once enabled, will actively prevent you from reaching for anything distracting. Now, unfortunately, none of these are free with the exception of self-control for the Mac, but this one's a bit of a nuclear option, so tread carefully. This will block all distractions on your Mac for a specified period of time with no escape option. Even if you restart your Mac, it will still be enabled. So. Use that one carefully. OK, I'll leave you with some resources you can use to continue down this path. Uh, here's some additional reading that you might consider. I'm still working my way through this list, so if you're curious about any specific book, reach out to me and I'll give you a more detailed opinion. Here are the links to all the software I've referenced. Don't worry about writing these down. You'll have access to them in the slides and the recording once it's posted. And lastly, here are some additional references I used to build this talk, as well as some links you might find useful for further exploration on this topic. And with that, I am open to questions you may have. Thanks for listening. All right, thank you, Jay. Let's see, the first uh, we have is from Anonymous. As a non-manager who has a manager who isn't doing some of these best practices, what advice would you give for the team members to address their managers to make changes and accountability that will ultimately improve the team? Again, uh, my shameless plug is to watch my managing up talk from a couple years back uh, on the Mac Admin YouTube channel. Uh, a lot of this really does get encapsulated into there. Um, there's there's a whole process of having uh, honest candid conversations with your boss about what they view as success um, and matching that up with your own uh, uh, approach to your work um, but yeah some of this really just involves having those open conversations and making it clear what your needs are for your boss it could be that you're sort of expecting them to guess what you need without telling them um, so the more open and honest candid conversations you can have the better your situation will be Great. Uh, two comments from the same person and then a question. One was we call the, that the Lego movie syndrome. Everything's awesome. Everything's cool. <laughs> you're part of a team. And then I think the other one's in reference to when you asked everybody to stretch with dad groans. Um, I love dad groans. The but the next question comes from John. Thank you so much for this presentation. It's really useful. Question is, have you ever gotten pushback from, quote, upper management about some of the recommendations or tips? I've had people push back on meeting three days slash times and blatantly ignore them out of spite. Basically, mm. how do you deal with aggressive management styles interfering with your style? Um, and that's a tricky one. Uh, I would say, you know, operate within the framework that you can. So make the changes that you have the autonomy to make, but you're going to bump into this. I mean, any organization is going to have resistance, even if it's passive, aggressive resistance um, to 
changes that are outside the norm of how the organization operates. But the more you can kind of be subversive and, you know, kind of approach it from a guerrilla tactic kind of way, again, in a respectful way, um, you can kind of seed this. And as, as they start to see the benefit of it, so if they, you know, begin to see, hey, my team is this particular corner of the organization is way more productive and healthy and they're doing meeting free days. Maybe we should consider that as an option for the whole organization. So again, it's 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 the long game. It's not something you're going to solve overnight, but in those places where you do experience resistance, again, operate in the way that uh, you have freedom to do so, and just be patient where uh, you hit areas where you're you're running up against resistance. Great. Okay, we have a Robin says at the office, my IT support work is interrupt driven. When I'm remote, I can finally work uninterrupted, so I tend to never stop because I enjoy it. The flip side is that I don't really have time for a life. Getting started is a familiar, familiar story here. Getting started is hard and not starting feels bad, but when I'm working deep, there's no stopping. Any tips how to become successful in time boxing, both starting and ending my, quote, deep work? Oh, Robin, 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 Robin. Make better choices. No. Um, that's an easy answer. Uh, again, there's no, as I, as I kind of stated at the top of this talk, um, this stuff sounds easy or it sounds simple, I guess, but it's not easy to implement. And, and you're kind of highlighting a very key point of that, that we get sort of in this rut of productivity. And in some respects, you're getting, acknowledge the payback that you're getting from that. So that is clearly satisfying you on some level. And so if you can identify what it is, I mean, there's a great book called The Power of Habit that helps you identify what's the payoff I'm getting from this bad behavior. And if you can get that payoff with a better behavior, then you sort of trick your mind into switching into a, a better habit, um, even though you're still getting the same payoff. So kind of sit with yourself and, and determine what is your, what is it you're getting out of that that you know extended stretch of productivity time that is taking away from your self care, um, and see if you can find new ways to achieve that same result without burning yourself out. All right, fantastic. Yeah. That is all the Q and A we have right now. So I'd like to thank Jim Rispin again for taking the time to deliver today's second session. Thanks for having me.